This is part one of the Ontario Hazelnut IPM workshop series for 2021, Introduction to Hazelnut IPM. My name is Melanie Filitas and I am a Horticulture Integrated Pest Management Specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. In this introductory presentation, we will be covering the basics of hazelnut integrated pest management, why it is important, how to scout a hazelnut orchard, as well as providing some additional resources where you can find further information. The workshop series can be found on the On Hort Crops YouTube channel. I've also linked to each individual presentation on the On Specialty Crops blog that I will be mentioning later. All of the presentations are grouped together in a Hazelnut IPM Workshop Series 2021 playlist. It's a series of seven presentations. And after this one, each one will cover the major disease and insect pests of hazelnuts in Ontario, including their biology, identification, and some general management practices. So what is IPM? IPM is short for Integrated Pest Management, and it refers to a management approach used in agriculture that includes multiple options to control a pest, with the goal being not to completely eradicate the pest from your orchard, but to keep it below a population density that causes economic injury to the crop. So we refer to this concept of the economic injury level, and I've shown that in the graph here. So essentially what you can see on the left, we're looking at the number of insects and we have a red bar that indicates the threshold be above which if you don't take any action, then the cost of the damage will exceed the cost of the control. But below that, it isn't worth implementing and control because the cost of the control is actually more than the benefit you get from not applying a control. You're not getting enough losses to make it worth it. So pest management is required when the economic loss due to the damage exceeds the cost of that control. We have another sort of definition that we've heard, we refer to, which is the threshold or the action threshold. And that is because most management practices take some time to have an effect. So you actually want to be implementing them before you reach that economic injury level. So we call that the action threshold. So that is lower than your injury level and it's the point at which you need to take action to prevent pest populations from reaching the economic injury level. It's really important to keep that concept in mind because there is a huge diversity of insects and diseases that are out there on the hazelnuts and the vast majority of them are not going to be causing a significant issue. So just because it's there does not mean it's a problem. I've shown you a saw fly. Saw flies can do quite a bit of damage, but they typically only do it on one section of one or a few trees. And that's really not something you need to control. On the flip side of that though, is just because you haven't noticed it does not mean it's not a problem. So there are insects out there that may be cryptic that you might miss because they might be active at times when you're not looking for them that can do things like attack the nuts. So for example, the lower photo is the filbert worm, which is a problem in other areas. And if you aren't looking for them at the right time, then you can have a lot of loss at harvest and, and then it's too late to implement the control. So that is why we want to be monitoring the crop and that is why we do integrated pest management. So we can balance out when we do and do not need to act. There are several elements to a successful IPM program. The first is planning and managing the production system to prevent pest issues from coming in in the first place. So that is what you're doing when you are looking for disease tolerant varieties that might not get Eastern filbert blight or where you're selecting an orchard site that is well drained so you don't get root rots due to excessive water pooling around the roots. The second step is a thorough knowledge of the pests, the beneficial organisms, and then their biology and behavior. So you need to be able to separate out the good guys that you want in the orchard from the bad guys that are attacking your crop. And you need to know their behavior and their biology so you know when to look for them and how to look for them. And you know when uh, they're at a key stage where controls will be most effective. So for example, with bud mites, controls are only effective when they have left old buds and are moving to new buds. So that leads into proper monitoring techniques, and that's going to be the bulk of this presentation, scouting for your pests and knowing uh, how to catch them at those critical times. And then once you have identified that a pest is a problem, the use and timing of appropriate management tools and strategies. So what are those management strategies? 
They're generally grouped into five categories depending on their goal. The first one would be cultural practices, and that is the manipulation of the environment to make it less attractive to pests. So we've already talked about disease resistant varieties. That is a cultural control. Um, there's also orchard sanitation. So that would be pruning out diseased limbs uh, from the orchard that might have cankers from uh, fungal or bacterial diseases and getting them out of the orchard before they can sporulate and spread to healthy trees. Physical management practices involve the exclusion of the pest from the orchard or uh, attracting it away from the orchard. So that can include things like fencing and netting for deer or squirrels, or that can include mass trapping. So some hazelnut growers have used mass traps to try to attract Japanese beetles out of the orchard and into the traps. Now, all of these have been done to more or less degree of success, but those are all examples of physical controls. Biological controls involves either the introduction or the encouragement of natural enemies within the orchard. And in hazelnuts, there is a huge and very diverse population of natural enemies present. This photo here shows lady beetles, which are extremely common in the orchard starting in early spring. And they uh, just sit there and they wait for bud mites and aphids and scales to become active and then they just start feeding on them. Uh, there's also parasitoids and diseases that can be very active against pests. So for example, with gypsy moth, there are a number of parasites and diseases that increase over time and really help to bring gypsy moth populations under control. Behavioral strategies involve anything that alters the behavior of the pest within the orchard. And that is most commonly by disrupting the ability of males to find female insects for mating. And that's really commonly used in apple and tender fruit orchards, but not so much in Ontario hazelnuts. However, in Oregon, they do use mating disruption to manage filbert worm. Uh, that's not a problem currently in Ontario, and it's not currently registered for use because mating disruption does involve registration, but is something that we can consider if it becomes a problem in the future. And then finally, there's chemical control. So that's using fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides. And that is an element of the management strategies. But the IPM involves pulling all of these strategies together to create a management program that reduces pest populations to an acceptable level while reducing the alliance on chemicals alone. So not no chemicals, but just having them be one of these many strategies that we're using in the orchard. The final element of successful IPM is record keeping, and I can't emphasize enough how important this is to a successful IPM program. It really allows you to validate if your management program was actually effective. It also allows you to attract trends over time so you can follow hotspots, see how they develop, or determine how a particular variety might be affected differently by different pests. And it's particularly important for hazelnuts in Ontario because this is such a new crop for the province. So it allows you to track what you're doing, especially since we don't have thresholds to determine if you implemented your controls at the right time, if you implemented controls when you didn't need to, or you didn't implement a control when you should have. And so that's how you develop this experience with the crop and this knowledge. So let's talk about scouting, which is going to be the topic for the bulk of the rest of this presentation. What is scouting? It's the regular monitoring of the crop for pest problems and other plant health conditions. And it's critical to an effective IPM. It is critical to your ability to make those management decisions. And what it is, is the objective summary of the crop condition and the pest situation. So it's not just you're out in the orchard pruning or doing other activities and you're noticing problem areas as you're going by. You certainly want to do that. Uh, you want to note that down when you're out in the orchard, but this is more than that. It is a routine monitoring of the orchard, randomly examining different trees to get an, a, an overall summary of what is going on in the orchard. And it's really that first line of defense. It allows you to detect pest problems early when they're still manageable. And it also allows you to determine this overall average level of pest numbers in your orchard. So you can determine if a problem is really gonna have a large impact on the overall crop or is just restricted to a particular area of the orchard. And gets back to that concept of the, and in cases where the, the cost of implementing a control in that small area would not be worth the benefits. So you begin scouting when the plants are growing and the pests are active and you want to continue until the trees are dormant or the risk of the pest has passed.
So as I said, it's the systematic monitoring of the average level of the pest in the orchard or its damage or other symptoms if it's a disease. We'll talk about specifically how you would do that. It's also noting the weather conditions because that often influences pest present and the crop's ability to withstand the pest, as well as plant health and crop growth stage, which are also very important in the plant's ability to withstand a pest and therefore your need to manage it or not. So it helps you determine if pest control strategies are warranted and it helps you to time them in such a way that you, you get control at the right time. So for example, there are some biopesticides that are very effective against certain caterpillars, but only when they're very small. So it helps you determine when to apply them. It also allows you to assess the effectiveness of management practices. So with your record keeping and with monitoring the pests from week to week, once you implement a management practice, it allows you to determine if that worked. So otherwise you're just applying it and not knowing if that chemical control or other management practice that you're spending money on is really helping you. Before we launch into the bulk of our scouting presentation, we just wanna to touch a bit on tree terminology because that can be quite important in pest identification because different portions of the tree are affected differently by pests and are affected by different pests. So here's a dormant hazelnut tree, which is a little bit easier to see the plant parts. Start with the crown. That is the point at which the above ground plant parts, the trunk, meet the soil. So it's the interface between the top of the plant and the roots. That is an area where there can be specific diseases affected there. And if there is a disease at the crown, that can have a really significant impact on the tree because it can affect the ability of the roots to get um, any nutrients or food up to the upper plant parts. I want to touch on suckers, which are growth that the tree puts out from either the roots or the base of the plant. Hazelnuts are prolific producers of suckers and growers generally have to go in and remove those two to three times per season. But you also need to be aware that suckers are very young, tender growth that's there throughout the season if they're not removed and that can attract a number of pests. However, the presence of suckers also allows the grower to sort of save the tree if uh, the main portion of the plant has been killed. Sometimes a sucker can be trained to start uh, some fresh growth for the tree. And then the trunk, which is the main part of the tree that forms the base of the tree. And there are two different ways of training or, or starting that tree, tree shape that I just want to touch on. There are two main methods of training and the first is single stem training and that is basically training the tree to grow on a single trunk. So sort of like the old fashioned uh, tree fruits. That is very common in Oregon. It has some benefits for harvesting. It also has some benefits for pest management. However, the problem with single stem training is that if the trunk of the tree is impacted by a disease or cold damage, then the entire tree dies and there's nothing to bring it back with. Multi-stem training is more common in Europe and that involves training the tree to be growing from about five to seven main trunks. Not more than that, so you still need to prune down or it gets too dense, but that allows the tree to survive so that if one trunk is affected by disease, then that can be removed and there's still a portion of the tree available to continue um, producing in the orchard. Continuing with our tree terminology, just going with tree structure. So obviously the branches are where we're doing the bulk of our pest monitoring. We often will refer on fruit trees to a scaffold limb. Those are the main branches that form the structure or framework of the tree. You might also refer to a lateral branch. That would be a branch that is coming off of another branch. Uh, it's often at a more horizontal angle to the scaffold limb. And you sometimes hear people mention leaders. That is the uh, uh, the upper portion of growth and you can have one or more leaders on a tree depending on how it's trained. But I do want to get into the branches themselves and the types of buds. So there's two main types of buds and the first are the vegetative buds or the ones that are producing the leaves which are what's doing this photosynthesizing for the tree for the season. So when we talk about the vegetative buds and I'm showing you both the young ones and the and the more fully developed ones we often look at uh, where the growth is. So the lateral buds would be along the size of the branch 
and then we refer to the terminal buds which are the end of the new growth for the for the tree or for the shoot um, and they're at the very tip of the branch and so often when we do scouting in fruit crops we talk about terminals with hazelnuts, when we talk about a terminal, we're talking about the new growth towards the end of the branch, but that, that's just sort of looking at new growth along the end of the branch. And, and that is often where a lot of the pest activity occurs towards the terminal end. But we also have reproductive buds present on a branch, and that would be what is producing your nuts. And hazelnuts are a little bit unusual in that the reproductive structures, which are the flowers and the catkins, occur very very early in the season and not when the tree is active the flowers for hazelnuts are much less showy than that of typical tree fruit crops and they there's a picture on that there it's just a small pink uh, growth coming out of the tip of a bud they're present only for a brief period usually in march in ontario and the flowers are pollinated by catkins which are also out only in march uh, they're active in march but uh, once they are spent, they sometimes do remain hanging to the tree. So it is um, not uncommon to see catkins on the trees during the growing season, but those catkins are not shedding pollen. They're already done for the year. And once the flower is pollinated and then eventually fertilized, then you get the nut cluster arising out of that. And so I've shown a developing nut cluster, which is what you're, you're seeing in the season and you wanna be examining closely because that is an area that, that can be quite susceptible to pests. So let's just touch on growth stages of hazelnuts, which are very different from that of apples or other tree fruit that you might be familiar with in Ontario. So we do have a dormant period with our dormant buds, and that is actually unique in that that is when most of the pollination takes place, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in terms of the vegetative bud development, which we're going to talk about now, we want to focus on that because of eastern filbert blight uh, because the susceptible period for eastern filbert blight occurs only when there is very actively growing uh, tissue that's the only area where the spores can really actively infect uh, during a raining season so you really do focus in on that for your timing your filbert blight controls which is a hugely important disease that we'll talk about in another presentation so we have bud swell which will begin late April uh, or even earlier if it's really warm, followed by bud break and advanced bud break. And that advanced bud break as the buds are opening up and just getting ready to unfurl their leaves is really the most susceptible stage for Eastern filbert blight. But that does continue through to early shoot elongation. So it's important to be able to recognize those stages. As we progress and it gets warmer, so into May, later May, and then we get mature leaves. And then that's when we are focusing largely on many of our other pests. And then finally, leaf senescence in the fall. So with hazelnuts, that, that early stage, the vegetative development is very important because of Eastern filbert blight disease, which is so important uh, to, uh, to the, the industry in Ontario. But I do want to talk about the reproduction, and this is where hazelnuts are truly unique. And that is because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, flowering and pollination occurs while the rest of the tree is still dormant. So I'm giving this talk in May and we're just getting past bloom in many, uh, many other fruit orchards, but bloom in hazelnuts is already done, has been done for a couple of months. So that is in May when you start to see the flowers developing and the pollen is transferred to the flower. So that's when your pollination occurs. But another unique thing about hazelnuts is that is not when fertilization occurs because the flower that you see here has an immature ovary and that ovary is only stimulated to develop after pollination. So towards the end of March, when you get that pollination event happening, the pollen is initially stored in a pollen tube. The ovaries start to develop and only after several weeks when the ovaries are mature, does the pollen tube extend to the ovary and fertilize that, uh, that ovary. So fertilization is delayed through till about early shoot elongation, so maybe six weeks. So the critical thing there is that it's a very long period where if there is some kind of stress to the tree, that can impact nut set. So if anything happens between pollination and fertilization, that prevents it from happening, then what you can have is the stimulation of a nut shell, but no 
stimulation of kernel development. So you can have blinks. And that's often abiotic causes, but there's also a potential for um, some pests to cause impacts on, the, on kernel development. And that is something that you won't see the result of until harvest in the fall. So once we have fertilization, then you, you'll start to see fertilized ovaries. We're seeing that now. We started to see that in hazel. That's, I'd say, in mid-May of 2021. Eventually, as those start to develop, we get nut clusters appearing and we've got these soft tender nuts. So you want to be watching them there because that's when they are most susceptible to damage by certain insect pests and other pests. And then over time, as they develop through the summer until eventually they start to harden and turn brown, and then they reach maturity in late summer, early fall, depending on the variety. Uh, and that is when you would be harvesting your nuts. This is just showing you graphically what I just described. This is showing the various stages of hazelnut development through the year. And you can see on the, uh, the upper left in March, we've got pollination beginning sometime in March and ending in mid-April. And then we have that ovule development, but the fertilization itself does not occur until sometime in May through June. So in May, if you have pest activity or you have adverse abiotic conditions that affect fertilization that can affect your nut set and your nut development. So we're going to talk a little bit now about how you would scout a hazelnut orchard. When we normally do this presentation, we're doing it live in person and we actually go out to the orchard and we demonstrate how to do this. So what we're doing in this video is trying to demonstrate that through a series of videos that we've taken in the orchard. So hopefully that will uh, we'll get some of these concepts across. So it's really useful to have a scouting kit. It can just be a knapsack where you have all the tools that you need when you're out scouting in the orchard. Is there nothing worse than finding something that you really want to get a sample of and you've forgotten what you need in your car? So I won't go into this in a great amount of detail, but just a quick overview of some of the things you might need. First and foremost is a hand lens that is really useful in viewing very small things that you might come across in the orchard, such as foliar mites or bud mites or scale nymphs. Uh, it, some scouts use 10 times hand lens. I recommend at least 20 times, but with a bud mite, actually the higher the magnification, the better. You can even get uh, digital uh, Wi-Fi microscopes that connect to your laptop that is, gets you up to 40 or above, uh, and that is not very expensive. It's about $40 on Amazon uh, and really, really useful with, with identifying bud bites, especially if you're not used to those. Traps are used to monitor for presence of adult insects in the orchard. We also use uh, tape for monitoring for bud mite movement. Um, we'll talk about that more in a few slides. Tapping trays, we will also be talking about, uh, helpful for dislodging certain insects. Collection bags and vials are really useful because you often might want to take a sample that you might want to bring back to the barn so you can look at more closely or send for identification. So you can get formal scouting ones, but they're quite expensive. Collection bags can be as simple as Ziploc bags or paper bags, depending on what you're collecting. And for vials, I like to go to the dollar store and if you go to the craft section, you can get these little small plastic containers that are used for containing things like beads. They're not very expensive and I find them really, really perfect for collecting small insects and, and, and containing them in there. A pocket knife and also pruners, it's just skipping down to the third row, are going to be very important if you need to take samples. So a pocket knife you might want to use to scrape a lesion or a canker to look at what's going on underneath. Sometimes that can tell you what, uh, what you are dealing with if it's a disease or something else. Uh, and pruners are if you need to take a sample off of a, tw a twig or a limb or something like that with the grower's permission. Uh, both of those are, are useful to have with you. And so for both of those, a spray bottle filled with a dilute bleach or an alcohol solution is very important because if you are taking samples from a tree, you do not want to be taking samples from a diseased tree and then go and use that same piece of equipment on another tree because you can transfer those diseases. So having that spray bottle to spray off any equipment you might use on the tree between trees is really critical. Flagging tape is also extremely important to have in the early spring when you set up your traps, they might be quite visible, but once 
the trees have leafed out, it can be virtually impossible to find a, a trap, especially if it's just a sticky tape for a bud mite uh, without having things flagged. It's also important for flagging cankers on the tree that you might want to revisit or that you might want to direct a grower to. I mentioned saran wrap if you're using traps because the traps themselves can be quite sticky. So saran wrap, you can wrap around the traps. You can still see the insects on the traps, but it prevents your hands or your car from getting covered in the sticky material that's on those traps. Waterproof marker is just important for making putting down labels on your flagging tape and things like that because it can get quite wet out in the orchard. We use paper clips for hanging pheromones, and we'll talk about that later. And a shovel or trowel if you need to dig down into the soil at the base of the tree, or if you uh, have a dying tree and you have the grower's permission, you need to remove the tree itself. So then the other material there, record keeping systems, we've already talked about that as being extremely important. It can be as simple as a notebook and a pen that you record your observations on, but there's also scouting apps that you could download off the internet that you can use to record a pest information on your phone. All right, the first step in successful scouting is to do your homework in advance and get to know what you should be expecting in the orchard. You're already doing that by watching these videos. Um, you might, can, might also have at one time used uh, our pest fact sheet that's being replaced um, by a new resource, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there's also a lot of information out of Oregon that you can use. Just be aware if you're using pest information from other growing regions that any pesticides they mention may not be legal for use in Canada. We have another a number of resources available for hazelnut growers and scouts on the OMAFRA website. Uh, the first two are our publication 360E, which is our crop protection guide for tree nuts. That lists all the products that are registered for use on hazelnuts in Canada. If it is not included in that book, it is not legal to use on hazelnuts here. Uh, similarly, we have a publication 75B, that's the guide to weed control for horticulture crops, and that lists the herbicides. There's also some information on hazelnuts in general. Uh, on, on the website. So that's www.ontario.ca slash crops. What I really want to highlight though is coming in the summer of 2021, probably in the next few months, is publication 863. It's the guide to hazelnut production in Ontario. And it has all kinds of information on hazelnut production, but it has an extensive chapter on pests and their biology and their identification. So I would encourage you to get a hold of that when it becomes available. Some other blogs and websites that may be of interest for more information. The first one would be our Ontario Specialty Crops blog at onspecialtycrops.ca that posts timely information on agronomics and pest management and events affecting specialty crop producers in Ontario, which includes hazelnuts. So there will be periodic postings of things that we're seeing in the orchard, including pests that are active at that time. There is also a blog called onfruit.ca and that covers more conventional fruits, but it does have uh, some information sort of generally affecting orchard growers uh, that may be of interest. Uh, then there's sprayers101.com, which has lots of information on how to properly spray a crop, particularly uh, with air blast sprayers and on trees. And that's uh, some really useful information on getting good coverage and all kinds of things that are important to effective pest management. And finally, I wanted to mention the Ontario Nursery Crops blog at onnurserycrops.com. That is focusing on landscape plants. And so uh, they're, they're not quite the same, but a lot of the trees have some pests that are common, particularly insect pests that are common to hazelnuts. And so there's some really great photos and information on uh, the biology of those pests that you might want to check out. However, for both the onfruit.ca and the onnurserycrops.com, what I wanted to mention is they will talk about pest control products there, but they would be pest control products specific to conventional tree fruit or nursery or landscape plants, and those ones are not necessarily registered on hazelnuts. So don't go using those control products without checking to our publication 360E to make sure that they are legal to use on hazelnuts in Ontario. I just want to mention another resource, Ontario Crop IPM. If you just Google that, you will come across this site. This currently doesn't have hazelnut specific information, but there's lots of general details about scouting, natural enemies, and soil health that could be of use. Uh, and you can also look at the tender fruit and apple pages that focus on some of the pests that we have in common on hazelnuts for some more information on that.
When one is scouting an orchard, it is also important to be aware of what is normal for your crop. And that's something you're going to get experience with over time. But just remember that the symptoms you see in the crop are not always due to a crop pest. So you need to know what are the optimum conditions for growing the crop and have we met those? If it's extremely dry or if we've had a frost in the past, that can cause an impact on the tree that uh, that is not caused by a pest, but you may think is a pest. So know what is healthy, what is not healthy, uh, and what conditions may cause an adverse response that are not a pest. Go into your scouting knowing the history of the site and the history of your crop. This is a generic slide that I use for a number of crops, including annual crops. So some of these don't apply to hazelnuts, obviously seed source or, uh, or um, specific uh, rental land details may or may not be applicable in a, a 10 year old hazelnut orchard. But basically um, knowing the history of the crop is really important, especially for hazelnuts because it is a perennial long lived crop. And sometimes what is done to a tree in one year does not become evident for several years. So for example, if you put on an herbicide in the planting years, say you had tree guards, you didn't think there was any injury, but perhaps you had a little bit of drift or that herbicide leached into the roots. And the following year even, you may not see any obvious signs of herbicides and you may think you're okay, but maybe that year you have a little bit of extreme cold temperatures a little bit early and that just stresses the tree a little bit further. And so then in the second or third year after planting, then the tree starts to become really stressed and then it becomes perhaps invaded by some diseases that take advantage of a weakened tree. That is a net effect of something that you did several years before. And you might not be thinking about that if you're not noting that down and sort of thinking about what has happened to the tree over time that could be causing symptoms now. So getting into the nitty gritty of scouting an orchard, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is divide your orchard into manageable sections, which we often call blocks, based on variety, age, or acreage, and scout those separately. Because pests affect different ages of trees differently. So when you have a newly planted hazelnut orchard, which doesn't have a lot of leaves, it can be disproportionately affected by foliar feeders, such as aphids or uh, spring feeding caterpillars, which can take a lot of that leaf material off and really impact the tree's ability to photosynthesize and establish, and, and so can really affect plant health. But as the trees age and put on a lot more foliage, they could tolerate quite a bit of foliar damage without being significantly impacted if they are otherwise healthy. But at that time, then when you start to have a crop coming on, then you start to focus a bit more on those direct insect pests that might attack the crop. Similarly with variety, you can have some varieties that are more susceptible to a particular pest such as Eastern filbert blight than other varieties, which is why it's helpful to scout these uh, separately, noting pests differently. This sort of shows how you might divide up an orchard. This is how apples might do it. They often will divide up an orchard into blocks according to size. So uh, 10 acres or four hectares might be one block. Of course, a lot of our hazelnut orchards are much smaller than that, uh, which might make it one entire block. But again, as I mentioned, you might want, if you have a particular susceptible cultivar for that to be a separate block. Uh, or if you have a very young and a very old section of your orchards, those might be two different blocks. When you are walking through each block, you're going to want to walk randomly across the orchard, often in a W pattern, possibly a zigzag pattern, whichever works for you in terms of getting across the orchard. But essentially, it is a, a path through the orchard covering multiple rows, making sure you're getting both the edge and the interior of the orchard. And as you're walking through, you're randomly selecting trees along that path that you're going to examine closely for pests. This general monitoring protocol within an orchard, the first thing is you wanna to try to do it at least once a week if possible. You wanna monitor at the same time each day keeping the light behind you as you approach a tree because uh, that can help uh, keep insects that are highly mobile from spotting you and moving away from the tree. You want to move randomly across the orchard, which gives you a more accurate idea of pest pressure than zeroing in only on trees that have obvious damage. So you're gonna to wanna to have randomly selected a number of trees. The number of trees you examine is going to depend partly on your time uh, and partly on what you're looking for. When you get to a tree, 
start by standing back and looking for patterns or issues that you uh, want to uh, examine closer, but then you want to get close and examine the fruit clusters, the undersides of the leaves, and the inside of the canopy. You want to make sure you're covering the perimeter and the interior of the orchard because there are a lot of insect pests that move in from the edge. When you're taking samples, if you are going to take samples, you want to look away from the tree when taking a leaf or fruit because if you're staring at the tree, you tend to be drawn to symptomatic uh, leaves or buds. And what you want is a random selection to give you an idea of the average level of, of pest infestation on that tree. This is our first video showing some of these scouting techniques. So this is me in the orchard in the early season. And you can see that I'm looking at a terminal. And you don't want it to take forever. So you're just taking the terminal, you're looking at it, you're trying to make sure you get the leaf underside and recording what's there. And you're looking both on the exterior of the tree, you're also looking internal to the canopy and at different heights as best you can. And again, you don't want it to take forever, but you do want to catch trees that are there and take samples if you, if you need to. So then I'm walking randomly in my diagonal pattern through across the orchard to get to the next tree. I get to the next tree, stand back, look at the overall tree. So if there's problem areas, I'm going to want to catch those and, and get in there later. I want to make sure to look down at the trunk at the base for any lesions that are there and to go all the way around looking at the tree to make sure that I catch uh, areas that I might not see if I'm just staying on one side. And then I start grabbing my terminals and looking at them and looking at the leaf underside and noting what is present there. There are three main monitoring techniques that one can use in an orchard to look for pets. And the main one one might use in hazelnuts is visual observation, just physically looking at the tree. But trapping and tapping are also useful for detecting certain insect pests that may not be as easy to catch with visual observation alone. So we'll go into each one of those individually. So some general guidelines for visual observations of pests on a tree. So you're going to be looking at the tree and recording the presence and the absence of pests and beneficials where you're examining it. And you want to make sure to look at the terminal. So in the case of hazelnuts, as we talked about, the terminal is that sort of end section of new growth. Uh, you're going to want to look at the buds along those terminals, and you're going to want to make sure to look at developing nuts for presence of damage. In many cases, the pests are not present on the tree at the time you're scouting, in which case you're going to want to monitor for their damage. So for example, with spring feeding caterpillars, they often hide during the day. So what you're noting is their feeding damage, and you're going to look at the percentage of terminals that have damage. There is no real good protocol established for hazelnut scouting, so we've adapted some from apples or from other growing regions. And so these are just general guidelines that you may want to refine as you get experience in your orchards. So in general, though, you want to pick at least 10 trees within your block and you want to look at three leaf clusters per terminal. So you have that new growth at the end of the branch, you pick three leaf clusters and you do that on three to five terminals on each tree that you're examining. You also on that terminal want to look at three buds or nut clusters as they develop in the season. And the terminal is your sampling unit. So it's the percentage of those terminals that have that damage that you've observed. Bud mites are a little bit different. If you are wanting to look at overall infestation of bud mite in an orchard, that needs to be done in the winter. In that instance, it's a different scouting. You would want to go out in late winter and pick about 20 trees and examine all the buds on four branches of the tree and record the number of buds that are infested with bud mite versus not. You also want to make sure to look at the branches and the trunks for presence of cankers from various diseases. And in particular, if the tree has a section of the tree that is wilting, then you're going to want to go to that that branch and you're going to want to follow it down to where those symptoms begin and look for the presence of cankers because that wilting often flags the presence of the disease and we'll go into that in future presentations if you are taking samples and you might want to do that for things like mites or scale or aphids where you want to sort of record the number of insects that are present on the tree and that's easier to do if you take the sample and look at it under a microscope or in the barn um, then you want to grab about two leaves per tree on 25 trees. Just going to touch on the other techniques now. So trapping is something that is widely used in other fruit crops and less commonly used in hazelnuts, but we're going to talk about where you might want to use it. The three hazelnut insects you may want to consider trapping for are the bud mite, oblique banded leaf roller, and filbert worm. 
For bud mite, that's if you are interested in knowing when bud mites are active on the trees when they have left the blasted buds and have not invaded the new buds when they're exposed for, uh, for control intervention, that it requires trapping to really find them because they're so small. Oblique banded leaf roller and filbert worm are two insects that haven't caused a tremendous amount of crop damage to hazelnuts in Ontario, but they can in other areas. And there are traps that are, are available, commercially available in Canada that you can use for monitoring for them. You may want to do that just because when you have damage at, in, at harvest, if you haven't been looking for the presence of the adults in the orchard, it's going to be difficult to know if they were the source of that damage. And you don't really see the adults out there laying eggs without the traps. Other uh, insects that sometimes you see in hazelnuts that would be coming in from other crops include oriental fruit moth, codling moth, and San Jose scale. Whether we need to trap for them uh, remains open, but if you are in an area surrounded by many other fruit crops where these pests are coming in, uh, it's something you may need to consider if you haven't been able to pinpoint the source of other damage. So I just want you to be aware that there are uh, traps available for these pests if you suspect you might have them and want to investigate further. General protocols for traps. If you are going to trap, the traps need to be in the orchard before the pests become active. So you need to know when to expect them in the orchard, get those traps out a week or two before. You hang the trap within the canopy as recommended for the pests being monitored. So that will come from your supplier of the traps and you follow the recommended density for the target pest. And you want traps near the border and some within the interior of the orchard. And you definitely want to be checking those traps regularly. So at the very least weekly, so you know when the insects are flying into the orchard, when you reach the peak trap catch, because that's when they are most active in the orchard and certainly in apples and other fruit crops, that's when controls need to be implemented. So in hazelnuts, the most common trapping technique that I have used is for bud mite. And that's really simple. It's using just a double-sided scotch tape that you can purchase from Staples or Walmart uh, or any other office supply store. And that's wrapped tightly around the twig, both at the base and above uh, blasted buds. And you do that very early season. And as the mites leave the buds, they get trapped on the surface of the tape and then you can examine them with a hand lens. This is just showing you the general technique. We've got a piece of double-sided so. tape, which we're just wrapping very tightly uh, in between um, a blasted bud oh, and another on. bud. <laughs> you want to have it really tight around there, and you want a there little go. piece sticking out at the end so you can grab it at, when you want to go look at it with your hand lens. I've left it quite long so you can see it in this video. It doesn't actually have to be that long. So other than the bud mite sticky trap that I just showed you, there's also pheromone traps for moths. Pheromone traps are really useful for detecting, as I said, presence or absence of that particular insect in your orchard. If you know the insect is problematic, it helps you determine peak activity or its peak flight activity and when you should time control measures. Um, that is used in Oregon where things like OBLR and filbert worm are problematic. In Ontario, it's really mainly for detection of potentially damaging populations than for timing those sprays. Pheromones are basically volatile chemical attractants that the insects produce to communicate with other members of their species. And the ones that we have uh, in these commercial traps are typically sex pheromones. So they mimic the sex pheromones produced by the females and they attract the males. And they come in these little uh, rubber septum that you stick in a sticky trap. So this just shows my colleague, uh, the Apple IPM specialist, doing setting up a trap. So these are very, very potent pheromones. You're going to want to wear gloves so the pheromones don't, don't get onto your hands and have you attracting moths on your hands. You, they come in these little envelopes, which you open up. And my, Christy, my colleague, is just showing you a little technique uh, that you can use. You can just place the pheromone in the base of the trap, but we like to pop a, uh, a, a paper clip through this rubber septum and that helps you hang it from the trap. There's a couple of models of traps that one can use for doing pheromone trapping. The most common is probably the diamond trap. It's pretty easy to use. It is something that you use for a few weeks until it gets wet and loses its shape and then you need to replace it. So I'm just going to show you how you would put that up in the orchard.
This is my colleague Christy hanging a diamond trap so you can see it comes folded. You just pull it down, it pops into this diamond shape and then you fold up the sides. Now those sides don't hold their shape very well and when those traps get uh, wet, they, they really lose their shape. But what you can do is you, this, you open up the trap and then you can take the pheromone out, you can pop it in the bottom and the interior of that is really sticky. Uh, or you can use the paperclip method we showed you earlier, in which case you would take the top of the paperclip and you would hook it into the loop where the twist tie is. And then the twist tie is used to attach it to the tree and you're hanging it at whatever is the direction of where, where the, the, the trapping supply company indicates that you should be putting the trap for that particular insect. The, what's not shown here, but is really important is flagging. So right now it's really obvious where those traps are, but when the trees are fully leafed out in June, July, or August, you're not gonna be able to find those traps if you haven't flagged both the branch that you have it on and the base of the tree. The final technique that I want to touch on before we finish is tapping. Tapping is something that is uh, sometimes used in orchards to look for insects that you might not as easily find through visual observation or trapping. So that would be very active insects that might move away when you're looking for them or insects that are hiding in other areas of the tree at the time you're observing them where they're, they're higher than you can see with visual observation. Insects that can be detected with tapping include aphids, mites, spring feeding caterpillars, weevils, brown marmoted stink bug, and many beneficial insects. Tapping involves the, a tray, and there's a, an example of a tapping tray that you can build. There's other, others you could use, which you hold underneath the branch, and then you take a padded stick and you wrap sharply on the branch, and that dislodges the insects onto the trap, and then you look really quickly and you just note down what you're seeing there. You would tap random trees within the block and it wouldn't be the same trees that you're visually assessing. So it's just sort of a quick look for some of those active insects. This is just a visual demonstration of my colleague Christy tapping a tree. So you can see her walking, quick wrap and looking very quickly and then noting in her book what's there. So you can see that it does not take very long uh, and it's just a, a quick assessment of what's present on the tree. I just want to finish up talking about how will you interpret these results. So the first thing I should mention is that in the videos, just for time, we weren't out there taking notes. But in reality, when you're out there doing all the things we were showing you, you would be out there with your notebook and your pen. You would be noting down what you saw, press absence, presence or absence of the pests and numbers, things like that. And then that's pulled together if you're a scout for a scouting report for the grower or as a grower yourself, you have all this data pulled together and then you're trying to determine what to do with that. So we're just gonna talk briefly on, on how you would go about doing that. So first of all, this reminder, we've already touched on this, that for many insect pests, presence alone is not enough to justify control. So we talked about the concept of a threshold that if you only want to be implementing a control if the damage exceeds the cost of that control. And so you've hit that threshold. Um, so we'll touch on that in a minute, but that does depend on the type of damage. So where, what is being damaged? Is it the fruit or is it the leaves? Is it a direct pest or is it an indirect pest? So if you have something is directly attacking your fruit or your nut, you're often your tolerance is much lower than that for indirect pest that's attacking the leaves, especially on a mature tree where you can tolerate some removal of foliage. With diseases, Often it's presence of symptoms because most of our controls are entirely preventative and protective. They don't work after they have uh, spread through the orchard. So especially for Eastern filbert blight and bacterial blight, the presence of symptoms spurs the intervention. So you're often just monitoring to determine how well your management programs are working uh, or if you need to just hurry up and start implementing a management practice. 
or pro program. Uh, for other diseases, uh, your, whether you're going to intervene will depend on the potential for damage. And we do have a whole section and our whole presentation on other diseases, but it's really going to depend on the stage of crop development and how much you're seeing and how tolerant the crop is. So if you have something like a root rot or a powdery mildew or something um, on a mature tree, which has uh, no other major pest infestations that you may need to not need to do anything about it at all. Um, unfortunately, though, thresholds have not been developed or validated for most hazelnut pests in Ontario. So we give some general guidelines throughout this webinar series, but overall, this is going to come with experience with the crop and with your observations over time. So that brings us to the end of our introduction to hazelnut IPM presentation. I thank you for listening and I've given you my contact information should you want to reach out with questions or comments. I would also encourage you to subscribe to our blog that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. For the remainder of the presentations in this series, we'll be diving a little bit more deeply into the individual pests that I've mentioned as examples um, and how to monitor for them specifically within the orchard.